But now, with all of that out of the way today, we're really pleased to start a, a new kind of a partnership, hopefully we'll have many more fruitful events, with the Canadian Museum of Nature. Now, some of you may say, where is the Canadian Museum of Nature? Anybody know? It's in Ottawa. <laughs> It's actually in the oldest purpose-built museum building in the country, and it is spectacular, and I've just found out that it's also haunted. <laughs> Apparently, they haven't seen the ghost since it was renovated, though, so perhaps the ghost got fed up and left. But a very interesting place. It's a lovely place to visit. And I, I've taken my family there, and we had a really, really good time. The Canadian Museum of Nature uh, is Canada's national museum of natural history and natural sciences, and its purpose is to increase throughout Canada and internationally interest in and knowledge of and appreciation and respect for the natural world. This is a thing that they do by putting on lots of exhibits about things, but also by sending researchers out to study the natural world and bring that knowledge back. And RCI Science is delighted to help the museum in this mandate of spreading the word by co-hosting this program today. And I would like to invite Kasia Majewski from the museum to come on up and say a few words about the museum and about our speaker today. Thank you, Kirsten. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so thank you for coming out on a pretty lovely Sunday to be here with us tonight. So as Kirsten mentioned, part of our mandate is to go outside ourselves, go outside of Ottawa and share some of the work that your National Natural History Museum is doing uh, for Canadians. And yes, of course, I can speak up. Um, so as I just said, we're here to share some of the work that is done at your National Natural History Museum with, uh, with uh, you as Canadians, as stakeholders, as taxpayers who support our work. And so I'm very pleased today to introduce uh, our speaker, Paul Sokoloff. The museum has an active uh, group of researchers who research Canada's nature um, all across the country. They go into the field every year in exciting places like the Arctic, as Paul will tell you soon, where they catalog uh, what they see in the natural world, they gather specimens, and as an institution, we've been doing that since the 1800s with the first Canadian expedition to the Arctic. So without far further ado, I will uh, present my colleague and good friend, Paul Sokoloff. Uh, Paul is a senior research assistant in botany and a member of our Arctic Flora of Canada and Alaska project. According to Paul, his work boils down to cataloging plant biodiversity in the Arctic and beyond. And as you may guess from the title of our talk, beyond might include Mars. On any given day, he may be somewhere really far away doing field work or in the museum's herbarium studying plant specimens or even in the lab analyzing the DNA of Arctic plants. Um, in his quest for science, he's had his clothes stolen in southern Labrador and flipped over a canoe full of samples in New Brunswick's Jacket River. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that. Oh, what, you got them back? Okay, that's great. Um, and Paul first joined the museum as a master's student. Um, that obviously wasn't very long ago because you'll see he's quite young. And <laughs> two days after submitting his master's thesis, we put him on a plane bound for Victoria Island in the Western Canadian Arctic. And he hasn't looked back since. Since then, he's been on five Arctic expeditions and recently on a simulated Mars mission at the Mars Desert Research Center. And that's what he's going to tell us uh, about today. So please join me in welcoming Paul Sokolov. Mars one day, I, I think he'd be pretty pleased with what happened. 
so I'll talk a little bit about uh, Mars in a bit, but first of all, I want to talk to you about what a botanist is and what a botanist does. And uh, a botanist is not a florist, um, as I remind my parents almost on a regular basis. Um, perfectly good career path. I mean, she's very happy, obviously, but not what I do. I document plant biodiversity, and mostly I do that in the Arctic. And so while I might arrange flowers on top of my head after about three weeks in the field, um, when things are a little, we call it field brain, you start to lose it after a little while, uh, being out on the land, um, we are mostly concerned with native plant biodiversity in Canada, and, and less maybe about the appearance of plants, even though they are beautiful, and more about what plants are and where can we find them. Uh, so, that work takes place at our museum building, and, and has anybody actually been to the, our museum in Ottawa before? Okay, so a fair number of you have actually been to our castle. Uh, so this is the on uh, Metcalf Street, downtown, sorry, McLeod, sorry. Uh, and um, uh, it's got beautiful exhibits, but we don't do our research there. We actually do it at a building out on Pink Road near Tattano Park. And has anybody been to this building? Probably not. Well, if you find yourself in Ottawa on October 19th, we actually have an open house, and so we'd, be, we'd love to show you our labs and our collection spaces. This is where I do most of my work. So, uh, you know, a botanist, you might think I'm just if surrounded by plants all the time, and that's true, uh, but the plants I'm surrounded by are dead. Um, I work in a plant morgue, um, and I spent a lot of time looking at tiny plants under a microscope, trying to figure out, okay, well, what plant is this? How is it different from another plant? Um, and how can I uh, tell those plants apart? And that's the process of naming species, which is what botanists do. Uh, but the most fun part of my job is through a combination of field and lab-based research, we're trying to answer that fundamental question of what is Canadian plant biodiversity like? And I mean, you know, any job that takes you canoeing down the middle of a river on Baffin Island in Nunavut, uh, or out to Victoria Island, or Pressing a whole bunch of plants like that after a couple of solid days in the field is, is incredibly fun. And I feel incredibly privileged to be able to do this kind of work for the museum, which does it for Canadians, essentially. We work for you documenting the biodiversity of Canada. Um, so I mentioned, and, and it's been mentioned before, that I do most of my work in the Arctic. And has anybody been to Nunavut or the Northwest Territories? Okay, a few people, okay. So normally when I, I talk to crowds, most Canadians in the South have never had a chance before to travel up north. And so most Canadians, their idea of the north is something like this. So we have big, uh, big icebergs, big ice sheets, maybe rapidly disappearing. Um, but most people think uh, of, of snow and ice and whiteness when you go up north. Uh, and actually, well, that is true in some parts. The Arctic is such a huge place and it's such an incredibly diverse landscape that's home to a lot of different types of plants and animals and people. And so this is, uh, these are different parts of the Arctic that I've had the chance to visit. So, you know, there's the high Arctic, which is very gravelly and, and a little barren, but in the low Arctic, you might get willow shrubs and you might get, um, you know, these big glacial, uh, glacially carved river valleys where you get all sorts of really interesting plant life and a slightly warmer microclimate. Uh, and then, of course, you have Victoria Island, where it looks like Saskatchewan. Uh, I'm, I'm from the prairies, so you know, you see your dog run away for days. Has anybody heard that joke before? Okay, okay. Uh, so while we're out on the land, we're out collecting plants pretty much all the time. So a lot of hiking, of course, with hiking with botanists is really interesting because, you know, you don't kind of go, you go, oh, look at this plant. Oh, here's another plant. Um, and so maybe in a uh, 12-hour hike, we can cover about 10 kilometers, which really isn't all that much. Uh, but we're collecting the whole time. Uh, and so here I'm collecting some cotton grass on southern Baffin Island. You might notice that I am armed in this photo, and that is because we are in polar bear country uh, the whole time. And uh, I never thought that I would actually need a firearms license to become a biologist, but Arctic science is, is very interesting in that way. So after a, a day of slowly hiking across the landscape, what we'll do is we'll bring all of our collected plants back to our big processing tents, and we'll press them just in this plant press here. Uh, so it's state of the art around like 1772. Um, you know, we do kind of an old science, right? And uh, so this is my colleague, Dr. Jeff Sorella here. He's arranging out uh, plants in newsprint, and then we squash it together with pressure, and we put it outside to dry. And once the plants are, are dry and two-dimensional, they last for hundreds of years if stored properly. 
And we do that in a herbarium. And I mentioned that I work in a plant morgue. Well, this is it. Uh, so it's a bit of a warehouse in our building in Gatineau. And within each one of these cabinets, which are locked up tight to prevent pests from uh, getting in and destroying the plant samples, we have over a million pressed and dried plant specimens, just like this one here, that document that base biodiversity of Canadian plants. And so by pressing and preserving that plant, and then putting on a label that includes the plant species name, its location, when we collected it, who we collected it, we have that point that said this species was growing at a particular place at a particular time. And then we can go back and check on these determinations to see if that species was actually corrected at that place at that time, or if the collecting botanist you know, just misidentified it. Uh, but we're also able to answer questions about plant evolution uh, by amassing this collection. People can compare all of these plants together and see you know, how are they different, how are they the same. We can sequence their DNA. And anybody who's looking to do a project on body doesn't have to fly all over Canada. They just have to come over to our lab and we have everything there waiting for them. And this collection is open to any researcher who's seeking to understand plants or animals. We have an animal collection as well, minerals, fossils, of 14.6 natural history specimens altogether. Uh, so in the Arctic, we think we have about 800 plant species that grow, including this. This is the Purple Mountain Saxifrage, the territorial flower of Nunavut. Uh, but we're not sure on that exact number because we're actually uh, still working on this Arctic flora of Canada and Alaska project we were mentioning. So right now we're seeking to figure out what all of the plants that grow in the Canadian Arctic ecozone are. Uh, and that involves a lot of field work, a lot of days in the lab, and you guessed it, a lot of hours spent entering data into Microsoft Excel. You cannot escape Excel no matter what job you're in. Uh, and of course, uh, while we're up in Nunavut, it's also very important for us to remember that we are in, uh, we are in somebody's backyard. We are not up in this terra nullius that people used to think. We are in the Inuit homeland, Inuit Nunagat, which is composed of four individual Inuit regions, Nunatiavut, Nunavik, Nunavut and the Inuvialuit settlement region. And it, while we're working up there, it's very important for us not only to um, learn as much as we can about plant life and, and connect with people, elders like Mary here, who was telling us all about uh, how fireweed is used in the community, but it's also important for us to give back to the community and leave our research notes with them and leave what we do with them. And we try to do that wherever we go. And that's, that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis at the Canadian Museum of Nature. And so you get the impression that I really like extreme environments like the Arctic. And so a few years ago, I, I, uh, I was talking to somebody and they said, you know, people do simulations of Mars at these places. So uh, maybe you've heard of the one that takes place on the slopes of Mauna Kea, high seas. And so, you know, I looked into that and, you know, a year is maybe a little bit long for me, although I, you know, I did talk with them at one point. Um, however, uh, there's another well-known Mars simulation station in the deserts of Utah called the Mars Desert Research Station. Uh, so I flipped an email, actually, over to the, the person who runs it, uh, Dr. Shannon Rupert, and it turns out she's a botanist, too. Um, and I have no idea why so many botanists are interested in Mars. Um, and this was before The Martian came out, by the way, so, you know, we didn't have, like, Matt Damon really pushing us to do this and grow potatoes on Mars. Um, and so I actually reached out to them, and, and they were running a big project where they were trying to get a bunch of really um, uh, Earth-based but Mars-focused science projects going at their station. And uh, about six months after this conversation, I found myself off to this place. And so this is the Mars Desert Research Station. This is a simulation station uh, run by the American-based Mars Society in southeast Utah, just outside of the bustling metropolis of Hanksville. And if you've never heard of Hanksville, that's okay, because their town motto is, where the hell is Hanksville? <laughs> you can see why. It is very remote. And just the, the look of the place really gets you to think that you are on the surface of Mars. And, and that's the point of the station, is that crews from around the world will come here and visit, and in one or two week rotations, or uh, as I'll talk about later, six month long rotations, live and work like they're on the surface of Mars. And this is all uh, essentially training. This is us getting ready to go to Mars one day by figuring out problems here on Earth first, like how will we not kill each other in an eight meter habitat? 
Um, what will we eat when we get there? You know, how can you make freeze-dried food taste really good? Um, and lastly, how do you prevent your helmet from fogging up after long days on EVA? Like, I'm not joking. These are, these are actual things that we'll have to figure out to go uh, when we do go to Mars one day. Um, but it's much easier to, to sort that out here first. Uh, so, uh, the Mars Desert Research Station is just one of two stations run by the Mars Society. The second one here is the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station, which is up on Devon Island in Nunavut. And so, that was actually kind of where my initial interest in this society came from, because they were not only interested in Mars simulations, but also Arctic work as well. And so, this is, uh, this is what that station looked like a couple years ago. Uh, it's not visited very often because it's on one of the largest uninhabited islands on the planet. In fact, people really only go to Devon Island for um, either hunting um, from the community of Greece Fjord or to simulate being on Mars. So you get that even uh, extra layer of psychological isolation. And of course, there's a bit of danger involved in that as well. Um, this is what the inside of these habitats look like. And, um, Last time I was in Toronto, I spoke at a nerd night about this, and I made the joke that this is um, the same size as a Toronto condo. And then somebody told me that this was bigger than a Toronto condo. So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, so it, it is tight quarters, and, and you can kind of imagine that this is designed to look like it would fit inside the cowling of a, of a spacecraft as it was transiting to Mars, and then just placed down on the surface. Um, you have an airlock, you have um, a laboratory, which is very important because whenever we do go to Mars, it will be for scientific research. Um, and you also have uh, places to eat and places to sleep. And uh, I want to give you a bit of a tour of the inside of this because uh, maybe that will inform you on my psychology and my willingness to spend two weeks on the inside of one with people who I'd never met before. Uh, so back in 2014, I was invited to join uh, Crew 143 as a part of a mission to figure out, uh, essentially, we were in the running to maybe spend a year in the habitat. Uh, this is a program called the Mars Arctic 365 mission, where they wanted to send one crew up and spend an entire year in the Arctic, overwintering there, simulating being on the surface of Mars. Now, this program changed a bit over the years, and I'll talk about that. Um, but we were invited to come down and test and see if we had what it took to be real Martians. And so this was my crew here on the right. So uh, we have a, a few of my colleagues. We took over from crew 142, who had just left. And they actually did some really cool things uh, later on. So uh, three of the members here um, actually went on to do a year in high seas. Um, and so this has been a bit of a training ground for pretend Martians. Um, and you know, I think once you've decided that you can survive the eight meter cylinder, you know, that's, you know, that's the daunting challenge. The rest you can figure out. Uh, so these are my colleagues, uh, I'm much, uh, a bit younger and a much skinnier version of myself. Uh, so we have Claude Michel, he's from Montreal, he actually works for Transport Canada. Uh, Paul Knightley, who's pursuing his PhD in um, astronautics at um, University of Alabama right now. Uh, that's Anastasia Stepanova from Moscow. Uh, she's actually just finished a 500-day simulated lunar mission um, in, uh, in a simulator in Moscow. Uh, Claude Michel, uh, sorry, that's Claude Michel. Alexandre Mangeau, he uh, is a flight engineer from France. And Ian Silversides, uh, last I heard, he was actually trying to figure out how to design spacesuits for a living. Uh, I really should reconnect with him, because that's really cool. Uh, so this is our crew's composition. So we had three Canadians, uh, one person from Moscow, one person from France, and one American. And the Canadian flag was not as big as the other one. Okay, I think we figured it out. Uh, we were definitely Team Canada while we were there, uh, and it was incredibly fun to, to go and to, to represent uh, Canada uh, on a pretend Mars mission. Uh, so this is what the crew quarters look like. This is, my, uh, this is where I slept for two weeks. Um, you win a prize if you can guess what my favorite color is. Um, it's pretty obvious. But not a lot of room, and that's true to life of current space missions. On the International Space Station, people don't get a ton of space to themselves. And that likely will be true when we go to Mars as well. Uh, you'll probably have a very small amount of space just to yourself. Um, but of course, you know, privacy is important um, because the psychology of space missions means that you do need your personal space and you need to get away from people. Even you can be best friends, but you still need that time away, and that's really important to keep in mind. 
Um, most of our days inside look like this. So cooking is a very important part of what they do here because uh, happy astronauts are productive astronauts, and that's true in field situations. I can say that from experience. Uh, but also a lot of report writing for mission control. Uh, so pretty much every day we'd actually have to write up for the, the Capcom, what did we do, why did we do it, what was our day like. Um, and I guess my point is that even when we get up to space, we still have to report all the time to a boss. Um, our boss is just located off-site and a simulated 22-minute time delay away. Um, I mentioned that uh, well-fed astronauts are productive astronauts. Well, you have to kind of keep in your mind that if we go on long-term space missions, any kind of refrigeration that we'll have will likely be for samples and not for food. So everything that we have is shelf-stable, which meant that when Thanksgiving came around, when we were in the habitat, we had a spam turkey. Um, it was very mash. Uh, so slices of spam with a pepperoni rose on top um, and reconstituted potatoes. It was, it was fine. I mean, it was my first uh, Thanksgiving in the States, so it was, it was really cool to have this different take on Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, no football, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the actual uh, food is also important at MDRS for a separate reason, and that was its initial funding came out of being a food study. Uh, the reason that MDRS exists in the first place was because they wanted to do a study on how to preserve food over a long period of time and keep people happy on preserved food. And that's where it came from. So we ended up spending a lot of time cooking. Uh, Ian made bread every day, so he was very popular. Um, we were ridiculously proud of our cooking whenever we made it. I think that was some sort of weird lasagna loaf. Um, you have to keep in mind that your standards are a little lower when you haven't had anything else for a little while. Um, and then you have to keep yourself busy in other ways, too, while you're inside. So we did yoga lessons. Uh, that was an important way to keep fit. There's a bit of a gym there. And we also have tasks that we have to do on a daily basis. So in this simulation, uh, I was the health and safety officer. Uh, so here I am uh, demonstrating to people how I'm going to take Ian's pulse to make sure he's not dead. Um, he's fine. He made a miraculous recovery. Um, and, and we also you know, had uh, fire drills, so you know, important. How do you get a spacesuit on quickly when you're out there? Um, there was dancing involved. Here we're learning how to two-step from somebody from Arkansas, um, which I think will happen on Mars. They'll be dancing on Mars, absolutely. Uh, and electronics. So uh, we had engineers, uh, a full engineering set in there. So uh, people were creating. Uh, we actually had Ian uh, harvest gypsum from outside and create a cast uh, to put on people. So. Uh, creativity kind of abounds when you're in a small space with no internet connection. Uh, Claude Michel was in charge of make growing our tomatoes in the green hat. We don't actually grow potatoes in the green hat because that takes a long time, but tomatoes are good for two week rotations of crews. And, uh, and this is a long term scientific experiment, actually. We set up things that go um, for a full year in this greenhouse, and, and the data gets published in regular intervals. Um, we also uh, sometimes take a bit of a, a left turn in the greenhouse. These, this is an experiment that was set up by one of our team to um, figure out whether or not urine could be used as a fertilizer on Mars. And so this is all uh, simulated Martian regoliths. So this is all the cat dirt from, uh, from Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Um, and uh, one of the treatments has been peed on. I think it's the left one. It turns out it wasn't so great as a fertilizer, actually. Uh, so that's what we do inside, but that's not why we're going to send humans to Mars when we eventually get there. Uh, we're not going to go uh, spend all of our time inside. We'll have to spend a lot of it inside because of radiation risks, uh, but when we do send humans to Mars, that'll be to conduct a really extensive scientific program on the surface. And to do that, you have to go out on EVA, your extra vehicular activity. So you don your spacesuit, um, which uh, you know, orange is the new black when you're on Mars. Uh, and you look kind of, everyone looks a little badass when they're in these. Um, so we have, uh, but you do need help putting it together. And so you can see Anastasia is being driven a little nuts by uh, soaking up her simulated spacesuit. I should mention these aren't airtight things, like these are not real spacesuits. They're designed to simulate what it would be like to be outside. So you have to wear thick gloves because that's what a scientist would have when they're out there. Um, and you also have to have the helmet on because that would be the realistic approximation of what would your vision would be like when you're outside the habitat. 
So once you're suited up and, and you're all ready to go, and you get into this airlock, and you simulate decompressing for five minutes, very important because you don't want this to happen. Um, when the airlock blows, that's just bad. You've all seen Total Recall, right? The original. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And so once we have decompressed and you know we're outside at Martian atmospheric levels, uh, we can leave the hat and we can go about our day-to-day -day science. Uh, we might, uh, you know, on any particular day, we might have a specific set of activities that we either want to do or mission control is telling us to do. Uh, so sometimes that might be habitat maintenance, where we actually go and start building tunnels between different parts of the habitat. Uh, but you know, the fun part was actually getting out on the rovers and getting out onto the land and exploring this really Martian landscape that, ha that happens to be in and around Hanksville. Uh, a lot of what we do at the Mars as a research station, too, is uh, in addition to simulating what it would be like to be on Mars, is outreach. And it's about talking about what it would be like to be on the surface of Mars. And so we, we're actually demonstrating some soil pouring techniques to some French journalists here who are not in pressure suits. Um, so they're not having a great time on the Martian surface today. Uh, but it, it's important for media to be able to come and say, well, why are you being, why are you cosplaying being on Mars? Why are you pretending to be on the surface of Mars? Uh, and because there are scientific reasons for that. Um, most of the work that happens at the station is geological in nature, which makes sense because when we do send scientists to Mars, they will likely be geologists who are interested in, you know, was there life on Mars at one point? What is the geological composition of Mars now? Um, and so, for instance, Anastasia is using magnet here to test for iron content in rocks, and she was actually specifically looking for nickel iron meteorites. Um, uh, actually, sorry, that one should have been a bit earlier. Uh, I mentioned that we, outreach is important. Um, we actually end up doing a lot of blogs and, and popular science articles too coming out of that. Um, and my proudest moment on Twitter ever was when the Canadian Space Agency retweeted me. Um, <laughs> I like screenshotted that one for eternity. Um, and so yeah, so you know, uh, talking about it is just as important as doing the work. Uh, but I mentioned that you know most scientists when we go to Mars will be geologists. Um, I'm a weirdo, and so I decided that I was going to do botany while we were out uh, in the desert. And specifically, I was going to collect the plants uh, that grew in and around the Mars as a research station while in simulation. And my justification for this was, you know, Collecting plants in gloves with a suit, it simulates collecting samples on another planet. So there's a Martian angle to that, uh, but it's really because uh, I love learning a new flora, and I think I'm a total geek for plants, if you haven't already picked up on that. And so I thought it was really cool to go out and, and bring this really old-fashioned kind of science to this more space agey simulation. And so we would go out on the land, we would collect plants, just like I do when I'm in the Arctic, um, except we actually had a lab and a microscope to identify them, which was actually like a luxury for me. Uh, and then we would press them and we would put together the flora of Mars, or at least the Mars Desert Research Station in southern Utah. And so we ended up taking all of these really cool plants, like this cactus, and turning it into herbarium specimens. Although, and this is fun, I discovered that gloves don't protect you from cactus spines. <laughs> And you think you wouldn't have to tell a botanist to be careful while pressing a cactus? You'd be wrong. Uh, I think I was picking spines out of my hands for two weeks afterwards. Uh, they're little tiny spines that get under your skin. So, uh, for science. So, while we were out there, in and around the landscape, we made 69 collections of plants that grew in and around the station. And uh, this had actually been the first time that any kind of botany effort had ever been uh, focused in and around the station. So everything we collected was new for the station, and we ended up documenting 58 species of plant and lichen in and around, just around the Mars Desert Research Station. So that included lots of things like vascular plants, and so this is what I mean when I talk about a vascular plant. Um, you guys know that mosses are also plants, but they're non-vascular. So does anybody know what a vascular plant is? Couple people. Okay, uh, I'll tell you. You're getting your second year biology lecture all over again. Um, and so, a vascular plant is something with roots and shoots and leaves. And so, you know, if you look at a tree or a flower, those are vascular plants. And we call them vascular because they have bundles that bring water up from the stem, from the roots, and then distribute it throughout the plant. And then it takes sugar back out throughout the plant. 
And, and we talk about vascular plants because typically botanists specialize in either vascular plants or non-vascular plants, like mosses, or on something that's completely different, like lichens. So then you all learned what a vascular plant was. Uh, so these are the species that grow in and around the station. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I think they're all really cool, but like, there's, this is like from Dr. Seuss. This is the desert trumpet, which actually inflates as it grows up. Um, lots of cacti, lots of weedy species, uh, just an incredibly diverse uh, amount of plant life within a very small, barren area. Uh, more cacti, so this is another species of Puntia polyacantha, the desert paddle cactus. Um, again, I might have spiked myself a little bit collecting this one. I don't learn very well. Uh, and other species too, like this is wormwood. Uh, this is a species of wormwood that grows in and around the station. Uh, with another couple of species of wormwood and rabbit brush. And um, I apologize if I'm just throwing a bunch of plant photos at you. I think plants are wonderful. And I, uh, well, I, I have to admit, too, that um, when I'm on vacation, I take mostly plant photos um, of my job. In fact, uh, I got into a fight with my husband on vacation once where I wasn't taking enough photos of him. Uh, so uh, just to tell you, there are going to be a lot of plant photos from here on out in this presentation. Because that's, uh, that's, I think, why I really wanted to get down to this area. I think that uh, by exploring this really unique ecosystem and, and documenting its earthbound biodiversity, we're actually learning a bit more about what we'll need to know when we get to Mars in terms of how to do science. Uh, but I think it works both ways. You know, we talk about um, you know, how, what kind of science we need to do to get to space. Uh, but honestly, space uh, science has so many different uh, side benefits for learning about Earth. You know, for instance, satellites tell us so much more about how our planet works that I think that it's really cool that it can work both ways, that we can learn more about space while doing science, and that space science can inform us a lot about how things go on planet Earth. All right, so I mentioned vascular plants, and then I mentioned non-vascular plants like mosses. Uh, but one of the most predominantly uh, uh, abundant life forms in and around the station were lichens. And so lichens, and I'm sure a few of you have heard of lichens, they're really cool. They grow on trees, on rocks, they grow uh, just free floating in the environment, uh, just along the ground. Uh, they're a composite organism. They're a lichen and an algae that grow together for mutual benefits. Uh, and they're really hardy things. In fact, uh, a member of this family here, uh, the elegant sunburst lichen, was actually exposed to space. It was put on the outside of the International Space Station for two months. Then when it was brought back in, it was fine. Um, so when we're talking about studying uh, organisms uh, in space, lichens are really cool things to focus on. And so knowing about the lichen biodiversity of this station too, things like Caloplaca trachyphila, the desert fire dot lichen, or Lechenora garabaglia, which does not have a common name but looks kind of gross. Uh, learning more about them will tell us about how life forms can be adapted to live in extreme conditions. And, and then, you know, just the diversity of it is astounding. These are all members of the same genus, but they all look a little different. And so it's really cool to see that there's a lot of hidden diversity, even in, in habitats that are, are really well known for lichens, because um, a lot of the deserts in and around southern Utah have been incredibly well studied for lichen diversity. And there's still a lot we're finding out. Uh, and lastly, from the station, uh, things like endolithic cyanobacteria. These are blue-green algae that grow inside rocks. And studying these things are actually telling, giving us clues as to where to look for life on Mars. Uh, because we know that if we find life on Mars, it'll be typically deep underground, inside rock, and extreme. And this, these endolithic cyanobacteria fit all of those, uh, uh, they tick all of those boxes. So essentially, uh, by knowing more about how these things survive in the desert, we're learning more about how to find life on Mars. Okay, so we often say in science that uh, science not published is science not finished. And so uh, all of that initial data was actually compiled into one um, uh, scientific article that came out a few years ago. And this is actually open access, so any of you can go and find this and read more if you like. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it's going to be a lot of plant photos, so your mileage might vary. But please check it out because um, we try to write this in as uh, accessible a manner as possible. So it's not just for other biologists, it's for anybody who's doing work in the station. So after that big first push in 2014, we actually got together and, and this whole Mars Arctic 365 thing that I mentioned, where we were going to spend a year up in the Arctic, 
didn't materialize for various reasons, but it morphed into this other project called the Mars, or, uh, the Mars 160. So we were going to send one crew to spend 80 days uh, both in Utah and then another 80 days up in the Arctic. And they were supposed to do the same program, a scientific program, at both places to really simulate, uh, to, to get an idea of what's similar and what's different at the two sites. So this is the crew here. I actually didn't end up joining the crew for various reasons, but I was invited to come back as one of the principal investigators for this trip. And so um, even though I didn't get to go you know, up from Utah down here all the way up to the high Arctic, um, thanks to flights, I actually met up with the crew as they were passing through the Inuit community of Resolute on Cornwallis Island. So uh, you know, it's kind of hard to avoid each other when you're in a town of 200 people. Uh, and so they were actually, they went up and did another, um, not only did they do this 80 days in Utah, they did a month in the Arctic. And, and the reason that it wasn't a full 80 days is because Arctic field work, you're often at the mercy of the weather, you can't necessarily count on getting in and out when you'd like. Um, so they only spent a month on the land. Uh, but they were also able to carry out a full field season worth of geological uh, measurements, uh, they were looking at how glaciers change the landscape up in the Arctic. Uh, it's a meteorite impact crater as well up there. This is a hot crater. It's been well studied by uh, Western's uh, Center for Planetary uh, Science and Exploration. And uh, they also had time to look for lichens while they were there. And so we're actually working on, this is Anushri Shivasava. She's a member of the Mars 2020 rover team currently. Uh, but uh, for the uh, 80 days she was in Utah, the, the, the month she was in the Arctic, uh, she was a lichenologist for me, and she ended up collecting hundreds of lichen samples that we're working on right now uh, to figure out what is the lichen biodiversity of these areas, how are they different, how are they similar, and, and what can that tell us about the search for life on other planets? Because even in these harsh, harsh conditions, you get these incredibly big colonies of lichens, and so learning about what makes them tick and survive, I think, is, is going to be really cool for the search for life on Earth uh, and on Mars. And so that was the, the Mars 160 mission. Uh, so I wasn't extensively involved in that other than uh, the PI duties. And I, I really do have to write that paper. So uh, it will happen eventually. Um, but the last mission I want to tell you about actually just happened uh, earlier this year, uh, back in April. Uh, I was invited to join Crew 210, um, who are known for their light writing skills at night. Um, but also, uh, it was the first uh, crew that they'd had there that didn't do a simulation at all. So we didn't have to wear uh, any of the spacesuits when we went out. We could go whenever we wanted, as long as you know people knew where we were going for safety, of course. Uh, we were even allowed to have dogs on campus, which was really nice. Um, and they're very good at finding out new plants for me to collect. Uh, but what we had were we had a team of specifically of biologists and of communications professionals. And this was the brainchild of Shedden, my friend here, that was essentially we wanted to show off the fact that uh, a station that simulates Mars uh, is still an Earth-bound research station. We can still do really cool biology and really cool Earth science stuff out of this base. And so we did more plant collecting and more plant pressing. And, uh, and we found some really cool things this time around, actually. Um, we also did ecological surveys. We were doing quadrat works to see what drives the diversity of plants across this desert landscape. Um, and a bit of yoga, too, while we were at it. And, and lastly, we wanted to really focus on outreach as well. So we did, a, um, a, on Reddit, we did Ask Martians Anything. Um, we did lots of uh, live streams with Live It and uh, Discover the Universe. Uh, and we just had a, a oh, Sam here is not wearing gloves, that's not great suit etiquette. Um, we just had an incredible time getting out and then botanizing, doing pure body while we were there. Uh, so uh, we made a lot more collections in a lot less time. We only had a week on the land this time, and we still made 65 new collections, uh, including 26 that are new for the station. And so uh, Shannon actually found this really cool little grove that had cottonwood trees. There aren't any other trees anywhere near the station and lots of other plants and uh, species for us to look at. Uh, so things like desert lilies, uh, but also desert onions, uh, which are incredibly diverse across the landscape, and also are great on salads. 
um, yuccas, so these incredibly uh, beautiful Spanish bayonets that just grow. Uh, we were about two weeks too early for the flowering. You actually get from the central flower area here this giant spike of these big, waxy, beautiful, fragrant flowers that attract moths. So uh, I think we'll probably have to time next year a little better. Um, we also just miss out on a super bloom this year. Uh, it had been an incredibly uh, wet winter, and so these two species uh, were just starting to pop up. And uh, about a week after I got home, uh, somebody posted a photo of these that went viral on, uh, on Facebook about uh, they were all coming up through these desert packs, and I was just like, I missed it. Um, but just uh, also like little incredible flowers. And uh, you know, a lot of these plant photos too, things like the Phacelia demissa, the Cleomella palmarina, um, and this Camasonia, uh, these are all only known from that part of the world. They're all endemic taxa that are only found in and around the Mars Desert Research Station. And so it's actually an incredibly cool place to do botany because you find a lot of things that you wouldn't see anywhere else on the planet. And I'm sure the Martian landscape has something to do with that. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's actually one of the centers of diversity for this particular genus, Astragalus. Uh, I like to show off this one because I did my master's thesis on this genus. It's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, they're all members of the bean family, and so uh, I'm nuts for beans. Um, and uh, I just like to show off that, you know, even in a well-known group, there's an incredible amount of diversity in form, in flower color, and uh, in just, you know, this understated beauty that can occur in these desert flowers. Uh, and in, in that, uh, you know, sense of that endemism, there's actually some federally protected endangered species that grow in and around the station. So Sclerocactus radiae and Hoffman sedia repens. Things that we don't collect, but we do photo document so that you know, we don't want to hurt an endangered species, but we do need to know as much as we can about it. And so often we'll try to document those population sizes for local authorities. Uh, and invasive species. Uh, documenting the spread of invasive species is also really important in a place where people from all over the world are coming. And so these are invasive grasses and invasive members of the mustard family that are growing in and around the station. And by documenting where we can find them, we're also um, informing land managers about potential mitigation or you know, potential for outbreaks of our invasive species. And so uh, altogether, that is what a botanist does on Mars. And so you know, it might not make sense for us to send a real botanist to Mars because as I hope you got from my slides, a botanist isn't somebody who grows potatoes in their own poop. Um, uh, you know, unlike what Mark Watney did in The Martian, if you've seen that movie. Has anybody, everybody seen that movie? That joke's not flying over everyone's heads, right? Um, but a botanist is somebody who uh, really studies the biodiversity of this planet. And, and I don't think that, I don't think they're at odds with each other. Uh, I think that we can learn more about our own planet while getting ready for Mars. And I think we do that by conducting missions like this. Uh, I also think we do that by doing trips up to the Arctic with the museum. I think that those are, in a, in a way, microcosms of what a Martian expedition would be like. You know, you have to get along with your colleagues. You're in an extreme environment, far away from help if something would happen. Uh, I think that we can learn well, a lot more about going to Mars while doing these trips. Uh, but I also do think, um, and this is my opinion, I think it is important that we go to Mars one day. I, I don't necessarily think it's important to colonize Mars. I think it's important that we go there to do science first and to really foot search for you know, the potential uh, of, for there to be life on Mars or once was on Mars. Uh, but also learning more about the solar system around us tells us more about uh, our place in the universe. And I think that's really cool. And you know, a botanist at a nature museum might kind of be a weird fit for going to Mars, but you know our mission is to uh, increase appreciation for the natural world, and that does include things like space, and that does include things like Mars, and, and I think that nature museums will be a really cool place to be when and if we do end up going to Mars. And so with that, I want to thank you all for your attention today. Um, I just threw a lot of nice plant photos and some weird Martian photos at you. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, I would be happy to take them. And I think Reinhardt would like to come up for a second. That's great. Uh, yeah, so we do have a roving, we do have a roving, roving microphone. So if you have any questions, you can up and we'll bring the mic to you. Great. While we're doing that, I'd like to uh, thank Paul. Thank you. Amazing talk. One question I do have. Okay, so have I 
I've seen a, a change in Arctic plants since I've been going. So I've actually uh, uh, been working in a few different spots across the Arctic in my, in my tenure at the museum. And uh, I think actually one place that we worked was in, in the Western Canadian Arctic along the Beaufort Sea. And uh, so we visited uh, this place called Cape Bathurst, which is close to the community of Tuktoyaktuk. And it's this long, narrow cape that projects out into the Arctic Ocean. It's actually the, the location of a rare endemic plant, uh, the hairy brea, brea pelosa. And its habitat is literally slumping into the sea. Uh, and we can see this when we go up there. And by talking to elders in the community of Tuktoyaktuk, we know that it's very different than earlier in their lives. And so we are seeing changes, primarily in the habitat. Uh, we're also seeing changes in, uh, in things like composition of tundra communities. And so tundra shrubs are growing bigger and, and leafier, uh, and that's actually causing an accelerated feedback of, of warming at the local level. Uh, but also tundra shrubs are dying off because they don't have snow insulation. And so we're seeing this tundra browning as well in parts of the Canadian Arctic. Do we have any questions? Yeah, hello, my name is Ava, by the way. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, I was at Bathurst Inlet up at Nunavik in mm. 2018. But then I took a lot of nice pictures, which, by the way, oh, okay. I got a loud voice. Yeah, you can go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I uh, took a lot of pictures up there of plants, and I brought them to show you. Oh, I, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but my question to you is, as a botanist, how do they know that plants are edible and medicinal. Okay, so. I mean, is it trial and error back thousands of years ago? I think um, at some level it's always trial and error. Uh, and uh, were you at Paige Burke's launch then? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, she's well, great. You know her, right? I do know her, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's a, uh, every time I give a, a talk in, in, in Canada, it's always a small world. It's like there's three degrees of separation. Yeah. So I love that. Um, no, I think there is a certain level of trial and error associated with figuring out if plants are edible or not. Um, and I think uh, it, there's an incredible amount of traditional knowledge in Inuit communities about plants and what they're used for. Um, and I think uh, nowadays a lot of it is, is oral tradition and, and uh, how that is communicated uh, between generations. And uh, a lot of communities have actually really taken this, uh, this uh, incredibly great proactive step of working with the government of Nunavut, the government of Northwest Territories to preserve a lot of this knowledge for future generations. Um, but if I was out on the land and I didn't know what a plant was and if it was edible, uh, I actually read that there are some techniques for figuring out if it's edible. You have to put it on your lips and see if it tingles. And, and I'm not, this is not like official advice at all. That is my disclaimer here for you. Yes, don't do this at home. Um, but uh, as some survival guides actually kind of describe techniques for how you can figure it out. Another question? Uh, panspermia is a valid theory for the distribution of life even since we haven't proved their origin on Earth yet, mm -hmm. it originated from elsewhere. If you were on Mars, what would you look for if you were looking for uh, signs of panspermia? Would you be looking for lichens? Uh, I mean, I don't know if we'd be looking for lichens necessarily if we're looking for signs of panspermia. And if people don't know what panspermia is, it's this hypothesis that you know, uh, life is spread out through things like impact events, sending microbial life out into the universe, and life here may have come from somewhere else. And, and there's still a lot of remaining questions about the origins of life. Uh, but I think if I was looking for signs of it, what I'd be looking for is, is first I'd need to establish, you know, was there present or past life on Mars? And, and then figuring out, you know, what makes that tick? Uh, uh, but then we have to talk about things like, you know, uh, then it becomes kind of a statistical analysis about uh, meteorite impacts and craters and things sent flying across the solar system. Because we know that um, uh, we actually have meteorites that uh, originated from Mars that impact Earth all the time. In fact, we actually keep some parts of meteorites from Mars in the National Collection at the museum. And so I think that. Uh, I think first we'd have to figure out if, if life was on Mars first, and then we'd have to figure out the numbers game. Um, uh, I'm saying that, of course, admitting that I'm more of a botanist and less of a, uh, an expert on, on astrobiology. Just a 
follow up to that last one, do you support seeding Mars with Earth life oh. if we discover that it, it is dead now? Okay, uh, that's a good question. That's actually come up quite a bit. Um, I can tell you personally, I don't. Um, and that's because I think that we should be going to Mars for scientific purposes, and I think that we really we should be studying it now. Um, I do think that the development of technologies that, that help us, uh, that might help us do that, would help us solve a lot of problems here on Earth. Um, I do think that Mars would be really challenging to live on um, and to, to change in the long term because of things like uh, perchlorates, these incredibly toxic soil compounds on Mars, um, and you know, the lack of a magnetic field, uh, amongst other things. So, uh, I guess personally, no. I think that um, I think that a lot of that uh, investment could better be used to do scientific research on Mars. Uh, but that's just, of course, my personal opinion.